So thank you very much. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to remind everybody that the Geologist of Jackson Hole is part of the Science and Nature Tuesday programs, usually had it held at the Teton County Library, but due to COVID restrictions, we have become um, quite good at Zoom, actually. And we have a longtime partnership, nevertheless, with the library and the library foundation, and we are very much looking forward to going back there when we can. And I know they appreciate all of our support, um, financial and otherwise, so thank you. Now let me introduce our speaker, John Heberger, Jr. And if this is your first geologist of Jackson Hole talk, let me say welcome. And let me also say that you're excused for not knowing John Heberger, Jr. All of the rest of you know him well as longtime vice president of Geologists of Jackson Hole and the outstanding leader of our speakers committee, among other duties. Frankly, he knows more about the geology of Jackson Hole than anyone I know. So it's a real treat to have him give this presentation tonight. Let me remind you a short biography of John. He's a geologist with two degrees, both from the University of Missouri in Columbia. He then had a nearly three decade long career with Chevron Corporation, half domestic and half international. As part of his responsibilities, he worked and or visited Venezuela, Argentina, Peru, Australia, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Japan, Kazakhstan, Kuwait, Qatar, and Scotland. He held both technical and managerial roles throughout his long career. After retiring from Chevron, John and his spouse, Susan, moved to Jackson, and they have lived here for the past 16 and a half years, where John has kept very busy studying the geology of Jackson Hole. So I'd like to now turn it over to John, who will tell us the geologic story of Jackson Hole in Northwest Wyoming. Thanks again, John. Great, thanks, Cynthia. Uh, let me go ahead and share my presentation file. And I will begin the talk now. <clears throat> so as I'm sure all of you would agree that are on this call, whether you live here or merely visit here, that this is, you know, this is one of the more spectacular places on earth. Um, and, you know, the scenery, the wildlife, the, the flora, it's all, you know, incredible. It makes for this, makes this an incredible place. But as a geologist, what I'm able to do is, is to look at <clears throat> this wonderful place and to understand uh, much of what caused it to be. And for me, that really adds a whole lot to the appreciation um, of, of what is here. And probably the main thing I hope to do here is give you a sense of that geologic story. It's a long one, not, not much less than 3 billion years of Earth history and to help you also have a greater appreciation of what you see when you look around, when you visit, when you explore this wonder that is Jackson Hole in Northwest Wyoming. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and get into the talk. Is this thing going to advance for me? There. Um, okay. Um, we're in the wrong file. Hang on. The right file must be. This one, okay. So um, a lot of purposes for this presentation. I've given you probably what is my uh, primary one, but I'd also like to give you a sense of just how much time is involved in making up what is Jackson Hole, to give you an opportunity to look around and understand all the things that contribute to making this one of the most spectacular places on earth. And to understand, we won't be able to dive into all this, unfortunately, but how very important, fundamentally even, the geology is to everything that you see, the mountains, the valley, the vegetation, the wildlife, the climate, and even more. So, you know, if we had about two or three days, we could explore all that, but we don't. So we'll try and blast through this in uh, 50 or 60 minutes. So it is a multi-billion year story, uh, but it's true too that the major topographic features that you see are largely a function of what a geologist would say is recent history within the last 70 million years. And those major events that we're going to talk about are a regional compressional event called the severe layer mitorogeny, regional extension, which you've, you're probably aware of the basin and range, that is a major extensional event, uh, Yellowstone, one of the world's great volcanoes. There's um, a relatively recent, about 10 million years ago, major uplift and followed by a subsequent erosion event that affects really the western half of the US. And then glaciation, which is a pretty significant uh, sculptor of the mountains and even the valley that we live in here or visit. 
So uh, it's also true that uh, a lot of what we see here um, is, has actually occurred within just the last four million years, four to 10 million years, let's say. And some of that is still underway today. So it's a story that uh, really is not yet ended. Stick around a few million years and things will look different than they do here today. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but it's the geologic uh, time scale from the, uh, let's get a better, uh, from the beginning of Earth's history about 4.6 billion years ago. Uh, the earliest events that we see evidence of are just less than 3 billion years in age. Uh, those are the rocks that form the core of the Teton Range. Um, then there's a very significant uh, 2 billion year gap uh, in the rock record here, and we'll just touch on that. I'll give you a sense of what's happening elsewhere, even though we don't see evidence of it here. Then the primary uh, things that we see, the rocks that we see primarily, except for the, those in the core of the Teton Range, are here in the, what we call the Phanerozoic, which is blown up over here. And you can see that there's a lot that happens here throughout, say, 500 million years in time. And then we come to the last 65 or 70, and that's where most of really the events that make up what we consider to be um, Wyoming in the nature of the way we see it today happened and are, in some cases, are still happening. So the major uh, features that we're going to look at uh, are mostly um, captured on this diagram here. The major basins, such as the Green River Basin, the major mountain uplifts like the Grovans, the winds and all across the state, the Fulton Thrust Belt, which you know is the Snake River Range or the Wyoming Range that extends from uh, Canadian Arctic all the way to Mexico, um, the Absaraka Mountains, a big volcanic pile to the north and northeast of us, of course Yellowstone, which came from the west, um, and then more recently, um, the valley that we know as Jackson Hole and the Teton Range, uh, which was not here four million years ago, the Grovant Mountains went right uh, across what is today Jackson Hole and the Tetons into easternmost, uh, easternmost Idaho. So let's look at for just a moment at this shader relief map of the western U.S., which will show, uh, I mean, Jackson Hole right here, it, it shows most of the major things that we'll be talking about. This major compressional event that we'll dive into in a bit here called the Laramide or the Severe. Um, there's this uh, major extensional event uh, defined by this yellow boundary here, the, the basin range that's been ongoing for the last 25, maybe 30 million years ago when it started. Of course, Yellowstone um, that uh, started way out to the west of where it is today. And then there's a, not evidence uh, really when you look at this, at this diagram here, but again, about 10 million years ago, there's a major uh, regional continental scale uplift followed by some, uh, really dramatic erosion that really makes, as I'll try and explain, Wyoming look like it does what we think of as Wyoming today. So what I really wanna do now then is, is to go step all the way back to the earliest rocks that we see and then begin to walk forward through time and talk about these uh, geologic features that make what, Jackson Hole and indeed Wyoming um, are you know, the wonderful thing that we see here today. So the earliest rocks that we see are rocks of about 2.8, 2.6 billion years of age, uh, crystalline rocks that form the core of the Teton Range, <clears throat> very rocks very resistant to erosion, which is part of the reason uh, why there are such dramatic mountains. So that's coupled with their, their recent uplift and the glaciation that's occurred even more recently than when they started to, to uplift a little bit. So there's also a zone of Him a Himalayan style suture. In other words, uh, a continent continent type of collision like is occurring today as India smashes into the Southern belly of, of uh, Asia. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as well here on this slide actually. So again, um, the core of the Tetons is formed by uh, crystalline rocks, metamorphic and igneous intrusives. Uh, and again, there is very clear evidence in the middle of the Teton range of what is at least currently the oldest known Himalayan style or continent to continent type of, of collision that undoubtedly formed a high mountain range. How high we will never know. And that occurred roughly around 2.6 billion years ago. So you know, what happened during that next 2 billion years, that 2 billion year gap that I showed you evidence of earlier, at least you know, it's a gap in the rock record that we see here, but it is not a gap everywhere by any means. What you're looking at here is the bedrock of North America and the numbers in here are ages and billions of years. So the oldest rocks are, are these pink ones that are greater than two and a half billion years of age. So you can see how this province crashed into the Wyoming province. There's a suture zone in between. And that suture zone, the ages are from 1.8 to 2 billion years. You can see this major Yavapai uh, Mazatzal uh, province uh, collided with the southern part of what is today Wyoming and to the east. And you can see evidence of that in southeastern Wyoming, but not here in the Teton Range. And then you can see other uh, 
collisional events, accretional events that farm what is today um, North America. So there's a lot going on. We just don't see evidence in that two billion year period for it here actually in the Jackson Hole area. But about three quarters of a billion years ago, we do see something that's very, very dramatic. <clears throat> this is, so here's uh, Wyoming approximately, and Laurentia is North America. There's Hudson Bay here. So North America is lying on its side and basically at the equator. And what you see is the uh, incipient breakup of a supercontinent that preceded the one that many of you have heard of, which is Pangaea, called Rodinia. It first formed roughly a billion, 1.0, 1.1 billion years ago. And at this point in time, uh, it's starting to break up. And that's what these um, symbols in here mean, that, uh, uh, that these pieces, these uh, pieces of continental material are, are heading up away from each other. So you can see that just um, you know, at one point in time, three quarters of a billion years plus ago, a piece of China was, was next door to, to Wyoming. A piece of Siberia wasn't far away. A piece of Australia wasn't far away. So this is all starting to break up at about that time. And we see evidence for this in the dikes in the Teton range. And that's what we're looking at here. So this dark dike uh, in Mount Moran is part of a volcanic plumbing system. And what you see here in these diagrams, one, two, three, uh, in this sequence like this, is the extension, the tearing apart, the breakup of this continent three quarters of a billion years ago. You can see how it thins. You can see how volcanism begins to occur. And <clears throat> while this was very deep in the in the crust, uh, when you know when these rocks that we see here were being farmed, um, you know there was a there was obviously a lot more rock above this. It's long since been eroded. So you're looking down into the, the roots of a volcanic system that existed as this, um, this extension, this ripping apart of the Rodinia continent occurred. And then about 200 million years later, again, we're missing about 200 million years worth of the pages of the book that make up this geologic story. Um, we see evidence um, with this cap of sandstone, the flathead sandstone on top of Mount Moran, of a major uh, erosional event followed by a deposition of these, uh, these sediments then that actually um, are found pretty much uh, across most of North America. So that sandstone cap on top of Mount Moran is evidence of this erosive event followed by this deposition around, around uh, 540 million years ago. And again, there are a lot more of these black dikes, these dark dikes in the Teton Range than this pro most prominent one, this thickest one that we see in Mount Moran. So uh, we're gonna continue to move forward in time. We're gonna look here now at the next say almost 300 million years. Uh, Wyoming, North America is still near the equator. Uh, and so tropical seas move back and forth across Wyoming throughout this time, <clears throat> depositing uh, carbonates, mostly limestones, in many cases, very rich in fossils here. Uh, it was a very rich uh, marine environment. There are major periods of either non-deposition or erosion, but still the sequence of rocks here you see when you look appears continuous and it's thousands of feet of uh, mostly, mostly limestone that we see then. Um, so North America again is not far from the equator and these are rocks that you can see on either end of the Teton range. You can see up the, on top of the Grobant Mountains. And when you drive through the whole back in the Snake River Canyon, you'll see these, uh, these rocks. We can move forward in time and look at the next, um, say, 105 million years in the Triassic and the Jurassic. Uh, North America has been drifting <clears throat> away from the equator, drifting north. It's still pretty much uh, very near to sea level, and there's deposition of either shallow marine um, or um, uh, non-marine sediments, sandstones, but there's also, like in the Sundance, um, there are marine incursions, and we see evidence of seas that spread across uh, this part uh, during this time across uh, Wyoming and much of North America. <clears throat> this is uh, considered the age of reptiles, not just dinosaurs, uh, though what Mike Schur is standing by here is a block with theropod dinosaur tracks on here like that. Uh, so think of a velociraptor or something like that. Uh, they were probably pretty good sized creatures. So, and you see these rocks uh, in both the Hoback and the Snake River Canyons, uh, certainly up the Grovant River Valley. And red is very characteristic of rocks in this age uh, across Wyoming. So when you see red rocks across Wyoming, mostly they are rocks of this age. We step forward <clears throat> into the Cretaceous and the last of the Mesozoic time. So from 145 to 65 million years ago, um, North America is east of where it is now, but what we would consider pretty much upright. And there's a shallow sea that extends from the Gulf of Mexico through North America, all the way to what we call today the Canadian Arctic. 
<clears throat> so here's uh, where Wyoming is roughly. And this sea sweeps back and forth across what is today the state of Wyoming. So here's a little diagram. So Jackson is here, 200 miles east, 200 miles west. And what you see here then is that shoreline sweeps to the west of Jackson, then back to the east, then back to the west, and then back to the east, and it doesn't come back again then. So, and there's nearly a complete uh, rock record of the of both the marine and non-marine sediments that are being deposited in Wyoming uh, at this time. So, so, and you see these rocks up the Grobont River Valley and many places actually across the, the state of Wyoming. So there's <clears throat> 500 million years that we see a good rock record of where Wyoming is basically at sea level, just above, just below, or right at sea level. There are periods of deposition and erosion both occurring. Um, the rocks were, of course, deposited as flat layers, um, you know, near or at sea level. And Wyoming is basically pretty boring in a way. You know, it's uh, at or near sea level for nearly half a billion years. And then about you know, roughly 65, 70 million years ago, the major, uh, some major geological geologic events begin to occur, which form the mountains and the very deep, broad basins that are seen across Wyoming today. And then later, Yellowstone, the Apsaracas, and some other things that we'll talk about here now as we go forward in time. So um, what I want you to first understand is that uh, there's a major compressional event occurring 65, 70 million years ago. In other words, oceanic crust is being subducted underneath a thicker, more buoyant crust. So the Pacific Ocean, you know, early, early a proto-Pacific Ocean is heading east, North America is heading west, basically. You know, and the result of this is a major period of compression in the, in the continent. And that's what we're going to talk about here. And that's really what forms most of the mountains that we see and the deep basins that we see in, in and across Wyoming. So if we pick just a point here 80 million years ago, there's North America heading west. You're, these are spreading centers and you're creating new oceanic crust and it's heading away from these spreading centers. So North America is, is overriding, and that's what these teeth on this yellow or this red uh, boundary uh, indicate. North America is overriding this, uh, this uh, Pacific, uh, Pacific crust. And you know, the result of that, roughly say 65, 70 million years ago, is compression. And the result of that compression is, is shoving slices of sedimentary rocks on top of each other. And this is the thrust belt, uh, which we see here, which again, extends all the way from Canada to Mexico. You call it the, the uh, Snake River Range here, the Wyoming Range further south. Um, and then as you go east into Wyoming, uh, you end up with basement cord crystalline rock cord uplifts that are in the major mountain ranges that we see all the way, the Grovans, the Wind Rivers, the Bighorns, all the way to the Black Hills, South Dakota, and the deep basins like this here in between. So remember now that the Grovans extended all the way into eastern Idaho. There was no Teton range, even though we see evidence in the Teton range today of this Grovant uplift. There definitely was no valley here, no Jackson Hole. So, and that's called, uh, this is called the Severe, and the Grovans and all the other mountains are called the Laramide Foreland Uplifts, if you like the terminology. And as these mountains are uplifted, we'll see more evidence of this. Uh, those basins are being filled by the erosive uh, power of um, you know, wind and rain and everything else, ice working on those uplifted mountains. <clears throat> so this is a cross section through the town of Jackson. And again, we're looking at cross section of things that happened, the results of, of this compressive event about 65, 70 million years ago. And again, you can see to the west, these slices one after another of sedimentary rocks shoved on top of each other. These old crystalline rocks here underneath uh, are shoved up. Uh, and farm the Grovant Mountains, the Bighorn Mountains, the Wind River Mountains, and the deep basins like this here, uh, all the way across uh, the rest of Wyoming. So these are all sedimentary rocks. They're sedimentary, sedimentary rocks on top of or on the flanks of the big mountain uplifts, but they're cored by these, uh, these crystalline rocks here like this. And they're, in, and they're interspersed between each of these mountain ranges are these very deep basins like the Green River Basin, the Wind River Basin, the Bighorn Basin. So, and so this is the major mountain building event that forms much of what we consider to be characteristic of Wyoming today. So it's a really important event. Not the only one, but it's probably the most important one. So as we move forward in time, we're getting to the point where 45, 50 million years ago, the compressive event is still underway, but starting to wind down. We look back off to the Northeast of Jackson Hole and we see this big pile of mostly volcanic plastics, volcanic materials from a big volcanic event that occurred during this 10 million period, 10 million year uh, time period. 
And what we see is that there's, there's this 10 million year stack of uh, sedimentary rocks, mostly um, volcanic plastic, so volcanic debris, but the event was not continuous. It, it happened, uh, there are volcanic episodes followed by periods of quiescence. And during those periods of quiescence, you had vast forests that developed across um, this area that uh, we see as the Absaricus today. You had dawn redwoods and other things uh, that were that grew here during you know, extended periods of time when the volcanism wasn't, uh, wasn't active. And then they're buried again by subsequent uh, volcanic uh, periods and then the forests will come back. So the compressional event's still underway, but it's starting to wrap up. Um, the Absarica volcanics are occurring at the end of that time for reasons we could maybe talk about in questions or not, but um, so there's the repeated establishment and then burial of these vast forests, and you're not too far above sea level at this time either. And these, of course, are the mountains on the east side of Yellowstone. And what I'm going to talk about here in the next slide is that just to the south of here, something very different is going on, uh, and that is that uh, um, you have the Green River Basin, or what we call the Green River Basin today, has uh, some major lakes uh, forming in it, and uh, it's rich in, in life. Uh, Wyoming is famous for the mammal fossils uh, that are found in it. But um, you know, if you go down to Fossil Butte National Monument near Kimmer, if you have never been there, I strongly encourage you to do so. You'll see that there's evidence of fish and reptiles and amphibians and palm trees and a whole lot more. Um, the Green River Formation, which is the rocks that these fossils are found in, is a tropical to subtropical environment. You're very near to sea level. It's fresh water, uh, but the floor of the basin is very near sea level at that time. And there's a little bit of these lakes without these fossils like this uh, that are found in the Jackson Hole area as well from roughly the same age. So if we look at uh, the current plate tectonics picture, um, we see that Wyoming's roughly here. North America is drifting west at about an inch a year. Um, the uh, compressional event is almost gone because the spreading center has almost all been overridden. North, uh, the Pacific plate is headed this direction at about three inches uh, a year. And so we end up with uh, the San Andreas Fault strike slip instead of the major compressional event. So instead of compression, most of the Western uh, part of North America is under extension today because we've overridden, North America has overridden uh, the plates that uh, were headed towards it. And so again, 80 million years ago, you can see 60 million years ago, North America is coming West and overriding this stuff. The uh, spreading center is almost overridden here 40 million years ago and at 20 million years ago, that part of it is overridden. And there are only little bits and pieces of it that are still uh, sending oceanic plates uh, crust in this direction here. And then, and that's the begin, beginning, you know, say uh, 25, maybe as much as 30 million years ago, you begin to switch from compression to extension in, in Western North America here. And so here's the picture again today. North America headed this way about an inch a year, Pacific plate headed this way at about three inches a year. And you have strike slip here. And instead of compression, you have extension. Uh, across much of uh, Western North America. And that's what we see here, coming back to this um, image again, the shader relief map. And we see that extension. So if you look at this uh, yellow boundary here, what you're seeing within that is the area that is undergoing active extension. Um, it all didn't occur at the same time. This extension only reaches uh, what we consider to be Jackson Hole today about 4 million years ago, but it starts uh, 20, at least 25 million years ago in the western uh, part, actually down here in southwestern most uh, California. We also, um, so there's a transition from compression to extension, and all of these are mountain ranges in the basin and range uh, province that you drive across if you drive all the way to Reno. Um, Yellowstone, of course, is a major feature. Uh, it's here today, but it started 17 roughly million years ago out on the Oregon-Nevada border and moved in this direction. Actually, it's mostly North America moving in this direction, we believe. Um, again, this major extensional event that is the Basin Range Province. And while there's not real clear evidence on this, we're going to talk about something very significant that occurs around 10 million years ago. And that's regional, continental scale uplift of the western part of North America. Um, and then very dramatic erosion that has occurred since then. And then we'll wrap up with glaciation. So Yellowstone, um, Yellowstone started back out here on the Oregon, what we call you know, today, map is the Oregon Nevada border, 16, 17 million years ago. Uh, there's another event actually, Newberry Volcanics, it goes the other way. We'll talk about that briefly in a moment. And then you can see other ancestral Yellowstones getting younger and younger and younger and younger until you reach where Yellowstone is today, the current day Yellowstone. Within the last two million years, it's all been in this area here. 
Now, brown areas are high topographically, green areas are topographically low. And you can see the track of this you know, Yellowstone event has left a track of very low, relatively speaking, uh, topography behind it. The red dots in here are all seismicity, in other words, um, earthquake events. And um, this rock here is still high. It hasn't been um, destroyed basically by uh, Yellowstone caldera events moving through here. It's colder, it's brittle, so it deforms uh, brittly. Uh, in other words, you get uh, earthquakes. If you look here in the Snake River Plain, you see that there's essentially no seismicity. It's too hot, it's too plastic. So the deformation that does occur, and there is deformation that occurs, it occurs plastically. In other words, the rocks are warm enough, hot enough that they can actually flow rather than break brittly. So the actual plate motion is in this direction. So North America is actually moving over the top of whatever Yellowstone is. And we'll talk about what that might be in just a moment. Jackson Hole, of course, is right there. Um, and so all of these things are ongoing. I pretty much talked about all these at this point. You know, volcanism, uh, all the hydrothermal features that make up uh, the wonder that is Yellowstone today. So, you know, what is Yellowstone? And, you know, the short answer is there's quite um, a vigorous um, argument that is long been underway as to what Yellowstone is. We know that it's hot rock underneath the continent. That is for sure. So there is upwelling in the mantle underneath North America, um, exactly whether it's really deep seated or whether it's um, uh, flow in the upper part of the mantle is a, a topic of, of hot discussion. Here's that Newberry system and uh, Yellowstone's here today. So it started in the middle here. And part of it moved west to farm Newberry at what is Bend, Oregon today, and, and that's still a very active volcanic system. And then the rest of it, what we know is Yellowstone, moved east to where we know Yellowstone National Park is. So any kind of model has to explain some of these other features. There's a lot of things about this whole Yellowstone system um, that are um, challenging to explain and, and uh, end up with different interpretations. So the exact mechanism is uncertain, but there's certainly agreement that there's very hot rock in the mantle underneath the, the crust here that farms Yellowstone today. So there are other models that are even very different than both of these perhaps in member types of models. Um, if we look at this diagram here, we see Mount St. Helens, which erupted in 1980 and this pink area is considered to be the area where significant ash fell. And if you went and dug a trench today, there's a good chance that you might be able in certain places down the valleys and would not be able to find a little bit of this ash from Saint, uh, Mount St. Helens. If you look here at these three features, you're looking at, um, to some degree, the extent of uh, where you could possibly, quite possibly, find ash if you dug or drilled uh, from the last three major events at Yellowstone, 2.1 million years ago, 1.3 million years ago, 640,000 years ago. Um, so, I mean, all the way from the Gulf Coast to, you know, the Pacific Ocean, and, and certainly there was ash distributed all the way around the globe. These were such big events. So, Yellowstone truly is one of the world's great volcanoes. And to give you a sense of that, <clears throat> this is a, a diagram created, I think, by the USGS. And what it shows is um, the oldest, well, 2.1 million year old Yellowstone, 1.3 million year old, 640,000 year old. These are estimates of the volume of material that has erupted from these major caldera forming events um, at Yellowstone uh, over the last 2.1 million years. By comparison, if you look at this little bubble right here, this is Mount St. Helens from 1980. Um, you know, inconsequential. Uh, from a global perspective. If you look at this diag or this bubble here, this is Tambora, which occurred in 1815. And it is the largest um, recorded uh, volcanic event in recorded human history. And very big, and it caused something called the year without summer. And, and there was a global impact. You know, but look at that compared to these events here. It's just, um, you know, the scale is the you know, order of magnitude or more different. But, um, in the last 640,000 years since that last big eruption occurred at Yellowstone, there have been 70 eruptions uh, that are much smaller, much um, you know, less dramatic, um, in many cases very familiar or similar to the uh, familiar eruptions that we've seen in recent years at, at Hawaii that Bob Tilling has talked about and shown uh, you know, wonderful videos of. So that's much, much more typical of what Yellowstone does than these major caldera farming eruptions. <clears throat> Now, Yellowstone is the world's greatest concentration of you know, mud pots and, and geysers and, and you know, hot springs and, and so forth. You know, you know, roughly half of the world's concentration of those types of uh, geothermal features are found in Yellowstone. It is 
there's a reason why it was the world's first uh, national park and why it attracted what it would attract four and a half million people last year or something like that too many um so um this this extension this basin and range extension um reached jackson hole and formed the Teton Range from the Grove Mountains and the steep valley that we know as Jackson Hole. This um, the, the displacement on the Teton Fault began roughly four million years ago and of course is still active today. We can look at something that shows that. Um, there's a maximum displacement of something uh, roughly around 25,000 feet of displacement on this Teton Fault since it began around four million years ago. So. Uh, but this valley uh, and this mountain range were not here as we see them today, uh, as recently as four million years ago. The Grove Mountains went right across here into uh, easternmost uh, Idaho. You know, as a geologist, uh, you know, there are lots of things that <coughs> show us, excuse me, let me grab a drink. <clears throat> there are lots of things that show us that this fault is is a still active system. This is probably the best one when you're trying to show, show somebody who isn't a geologist and it's a LIDAR image. Um, uh, and you can like by like detecting and ranging it. Uh, it's a tool that allows you basically to see the surface of the earth without all the overlying uh, vegetation. And you can see the scar here that is the Teton Fault. It goes right along the base of the mountains. <clears throat> These are moraines uh, from the last glacial event about 14, 15,000 years ago. You can see there's about a 30 meter, say 100 foot um, offset here in that moraine. So we know that there's been 100 feet of displacement, roughly, approximately, on the Teton Fault in the last 14, 15,000 years. It truly is a very significant uh, fault system, and it's one that uh, definitely, um, from a geolo geologist's perspective, is still an active fault system. So let's um, move on and talk about something else here that uh, I haven't spent the time to talk about in, in past presentations. And that's this regional uplift um, and the resultant major erosion that occurs um, throughout the Rocky Mountain region, not just in Jackson Hole, not just even in Wyoming. Um, this is uh, a series of stratigraphic columns across the state of Wyoming from the western side of the state all the way to the eastern side of the state. Um, and so we're looking, uh, this is, so these are columns of named rock units and uh, what I want to call your attention to are these uh, squiggly lines like this here and this here and so forth. And those are erosional events. Um, there, are, there are times when erosion is, is, is occurring, maybe no deposition. And if you look at these places like this or like this right here, there's a big gap in the rock record here, uh, for instance, in the North and West Green River Basin. But look at this here, the squiggly line goes all the way basically across the state of Wyoming. And indeed, it can be found uh, in Montana and Colorado and many other places in the Rocky Mountain West. This is a ve very major unconformity that occurs. The best dating on it is roughly about 10 million years ago. <clears throat> and what it, what it is, is, you know, well, so what is the result of this event? Let's go ahead and take a look at that then. Um, here's a picture of a diagram of what uh, much of Wyoming looked like at the end of that Laramide event when these major mountains and the intervening basins that was forming, uh, and that's wrapping up roughly around 45, 50 million years ago. So you have mountains uh, that are thrust up and they're around six or 7,000 feet of elevation. The basin floors are near sea level. Uh, we are not real high at that point in time. Uh, and you can see there's erosion, of course, occurring, and that's how the basins are filling with the debris coming off these mountains. If you look at about 10 million years ago, just before that major uplift and um, uh, erosional event begins to occur, you can see that the mountains are essentially very nearly buried. In some cases, uh, for instance, with the Owl Creek Mountains, uh, they probably were completely buried. So the debris that's being shed off of these mountains is filling um, these basins very, very deeply. But at this point in time, roughly 10 million years ago, they're still very near sea level, not far above sea level. So then you get this very major uplift. Uh, the whole Western US is, is uplifted some five, six or more thousand feet. And what's the result of that then? <clears throat> well, what you can see today is then the mountains become unburied because you're eroding all the rocks that buried them. The basins are being excavated as well, evacuated. Sediment is on its way down the fluvial river systems, on its way to the Gulf of Mexico, to the Gulf of California, or to the Pacific, you know, down, you know, down the ancestral Snake River and Columbia River systems. So 
So what do we, you know, what's that look like today? Well, you see it um, all the time when you look anywhere in, in Wyoming. This is uh, a picture of the Bighorn Basin. There are the Bighorn Mountains in the background. And you see all these rocks that have been exposed. They're more resistant, so they stick up a little bit. And you're removing thousands and thousands of feet of sediment that filled this basin at, at, you know, about 10 million years ago. Here's another example of very deep um, um, erosion. You know, these rocks are on their way. They're not there yet, but all these that are gone have gone, uh, you know, to one of the major ocean basins that uh, are to the south or to the west of uh, North America today. This is a view again in the Bighorn Basin. These are the Bighorn Mountains. So imagine this mountain range here, you know, with uh, sediments lapping way up on it here. They're, they're being eroded today, and that's why these ridges all stick out. This is uh, the upper part of the Alcova Reservoir, and you can see this and many other deep canyons in the, in the state of Wyoming have been formed in the last 10 million years as a result of this very significant uplift and then the very significant erosion that's had 10 million years to work its way on, on, um, on Wyoming. This is, uh, these are the Owl Creek Mountains. This is the Wind River, so this is Wind River Canyon. And as I mentioned before, the Owl Creeks are actually one mountain range that it is believed probably were completely buried and this ancestral Wind River uh, wound its way very happily and very quiescently right across what uh, this buried mountain range. And then when this uplift uh, occurs, uh, the, the river begins to get trapped uh, as it tries to you know, keep up with the uplift. And eventually it gets trapped entirely in this very deep, very hard rock, very resistant canyon, just by the fact that the uplift doesn't quite uh, uplift too fast and the river is able to keep up and cut this canyon through this mountain range. But this was not the case, say, 10 million years ago. So here's a view from South Pass looking to the north that's the Owl Creek Range, actually, that you see way off in the haze in the distance there to the north. And you can see all of these rocks outcropping here. There's a tremendous amount of erosion that's occurred. And this, this is a really good place to see it, because if you look at this feature here, what you see is a very flat surface. And you can see that these rocks were all covered by um, the sediments that form this flat surface. This is a remnant of one of these uh, 10 million year ago surfaces that filled this whole basin. So there's thousands and thousands of feet of rock, of sediment that have been eroded, been evacuated out of the basin by, by the Wind River off to the north, eventually to the Missouri and then down to the Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico. Other basins, the sediments evacuate in different directions. So this is a really good example of you know, some of the, the remnant surfaces that are left from before this uplift occurred and before this major erosional event occurred. So 10 million years ago, this basin was very near sea level. Now this basin, the floor of it is five to 6,000 feet in elevation. Here's a view in, uh, down in the Southern Green River Basin uh, near Flaming Gorge. And again, you can see the dramatic erosion that has occurred pretty much all in the last 10 million years or so. So why? Um, <clears throat> the short answer is we don't know. Um, there are, um, you know, there, there is speculation um, and farm speculation to some extent. And there's talk about perhaps North America overrode some kind of a massive uh, uh, island arc system and, and that uplifted North America. Well, maybe, maybe not. There's talk about maybe the lower part of the crust delaminated. The real dense, heaviest part, the lower part of the crust just broke off and subsided down into the mantle and the lighter part bobbed up um, as it would. Uh, but the short answer is we don't know. We know it happened. Um, it's why you walk downhill all the way from the Rocky Mountains, basically to the Mississippi River in the middle of the continent. Um, it's a very major event, uh, and it's one that uh, you, know, you can see evidence of everywhere when you drive or go anywhere in the state of Wyoming. So it's a very major shaper, what we see today uh, in Wyoming and, and beyond. It's a, re a result of you know, what I, as a geologist, would call a recent event, only about 10 million years ago to present, regional uplift and subsequent erosion of the basins that formed and filled during the Laramide. Those basins you know, back at the Laramide time were very nearly at sea level. Mountains uh, were nearly buried following the Laramide, and Wyoming is still quite high compared to what it was, say, 10 plus million years ago, from near sea level to a mile high, the basin, you know, the basin elevations today. So it's a very major, very significant event. So glaciation um, is the last thing we really want to talk about here quickly. Um, you know, the, the Teton Range is so spectacular for a number of reasons, but one is the sculpting that has occurred as a result of the glaciation, the glacial events that have occurred over the last two and a half million years or so. These U-shaped valleys, the horns and arrets, the sharp ridges that uh, characterize the Tetons. 
are very definitely um, to a large degree a result of this glaciation that has occurred. And this has all occurred within the last two and a half million years and there have been multiple glacial episodes and the evidence is really all around us. Um, one of the things that you probably don't think about much is the fact that the valley floor or Jackson Hole is filled with a glacial outwash, um, which is not the case if you go over the Tetons on the other side in Teton Valley, Idaho. You didn't have uh, the major glacier coming down out of Yellowstone um, and, and dumping all of this sediment um, as the glaciers melted, all this stuff is sediment that was, uh, that was deposited from the glacial outwash. And the thing about this is that um, glacial outwash makes for a very poor um, agricultural environment. All the fine sediment, all the clays and fine grain materials um, don't stay here. Uh, glacial outwash, there's a lot of water going down. So all the fine stuff disappears down the river systems and flows to the, flows to the Pacific. That didn't happen on the other side of the Tetons. And so the agricultural environment is really pretty good on the, on the west side of the Tetons. You know, I will um, more than just suggest that the reason that Rockefeller was able to buy and make basically what is Grand Teton National Park today is a result of the fact that Jackson Hole, the floor is not suitable for uh, agricultural purposes. And that's because of this glacial outwash. Um, and so he was able to, you know, to buy at pretty relatively cheap prices, much of what is today uh, Grand Teton National Park. So this glacial event is certainly a major factor in, 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 in what we see, what we have here today. So, and the, um, the maximum extent of the most recent two glacial uh, advances from Yellowstone are seen here. This is the Burnt Ridge about 14 to 15,000 years ago. It's as far as it got. 130,000 years ago, the one that preceded this one, this is the Pine Dale, this is called the Bull Lake glacial event, reached all the way down, not quite to Hoback Junction down here. And the ice thickness was about 1,500 feet thick here at Jackson, uh, the town of Jackson, and 2,000 to 2,500 feet thick as you move up the valley here. So there was a lot of ice that flowed down the valley and then alpine glaciers that flowed out of the canyons here in the Teton Range. So there were repeated glacial episodes over two and a half million years, you know, a lot of ice and glaciers truly have been a major sculptor of the landscape that we call Jackson Hole. So, um, you know, this is an introduction to the geologic story of what is Jackson Hole in Northwest Wyoming. Um, you know, we could talk uh, for, I could talk for too long about all these things, but suffice it to say um, that the geology has had an exceedingly major influence on not just the topography that we see, but the weather, of course, the animal life, the plant life, and as I just talked about with respect to the formation of Grand Teton National Park, the human history as well. So any story about Jackson Hole and Northwest Wyoming is truly one that is founded on geology. If we look to the future, uh, earthquakes are certainly going to continue to occur. Here's the scar of the Teton Fault above Spring Lake. Here's Zeppelin Lake, 1959 earthquake. Um, of course, Yellowstone, the world's greatest concentrations of geothermal features. Uh, you know, that's going to continue to change and evolve. There's a lot of heat underneath. Um, you know, Yellowstone is a very large volcano, volcanic system. Um, something that maybe you don't think very much about is running water, ice, freeze, thaw. Uh, slowly from your perspective, but from a geologist's perspective, this occurs you know, at a pretty rapid rate with the kind of uplift and features that we have here. And it truly is a major uh, farmer, sculptor of uh, the landscape. Uh, this is a nice uh, diagram from the USGS. <clears throat> and we can look at uh, things that uh, are, have happened or likely to happen here again from more frequent to more destructive. Hydrothermal explosions occur in Yellowstone frequently, earthquakes, uh, um, even though the last one hasn't occurred here, big one hasn't occurred since uh, you know the short human history here. Teton Fault is an active system; it will happen again. You know, th again, there's been 70 um, uh, uh, volcanic events at Yellowstone in the last 640,000 years. There'll be more of those that occur, uh, and maybe, perhaps, eventually, you know, uh, more caldera forming eruptions. Though there's no guarantee, no clear evidence uh, that that it will or will not. Um, and um, you know, mankind is probably changing the climate, uh, but before that happened, it's, it was quite likely that uh, the Earth would go back into more glacial periods here. I mean, that the last two and a half million years has been in and out and in and out many times over the last two and a half million years. So, um, in summary, um, Wyoming, Jackson Hole, Northwest Wyoming's history is a geologic story, really all aspects of it. It's a long story, nearly three billion years in age. 
um, you know, the Precambrian rocks are igneous intrusives, there's metamorphism, there's volcanism, evidence for all of that. For roughly 500 million years, very nearly, Wyoming is basically at sea level, just below, just above, um, pretty flat, pretty boring from that kind of perspective. And around 55, 65, 70 million years ago, there's this major compressional event that reaches Wyoming and forms all of those mountains, all of them except the Tetons and the Apsaracas that we see in the state of Wyoming, the major uplifts, the mountains and the basins in between. Then during the last um, 55, 60 million years ago, during the Cenozoic, there has been the Apsaracas, this great big volcanic pile, um, you know, forest and volcanic events, one after another for roughly 10 million years. Yellowstone starts to the west about 17 million years ago and eventually reaches us here. There's this regional uplift, um, a whole western half of the U.S. that begins around 10 million years ago in dramatic subsequent erosion. The major extensional event that is the Basin or Range, which begins about 25 or 30 million years ago, reaches Jackson Hole around 4 million years ago and is active today. And from a geologist's perspective, we'd even say that the glacial uh, events are still likely to happen again if uh, you know if we don't let the climate get too too warm so you know everything here it's all a geologic story from my perspective you know not just the rocks that we see but also the flora the fauna the weather and indeed our own our own human history of this area are clearly a result of the geologic events that have occurred here over the last you know, nearly three billion years especially over the last 70 billion years a million years or so so you know i'll leave you with the thought that I really do believe that it all results from the geology. Hopefully you will be able to look around you and see, understand and enjoy even more this wonderful place that is Jackson Hole in Northwest Wyoming. So thanks, um, I need a drink and uh, well, I'll tea right now, maybe a glass of wine later. And if Mike has any questions, I will entertain those now. Uh, yes, this is Mike Schur, John, thank you very much for uh... Wow, I, I'd like to sign up for the three-day presentation, please, uh, when you're ready to do that. But uh, not yeah, tonight. <laughs> no, not tonight. Uh, lots of questions. And so one question, you, you, you describe how Western North America is compressed and squeezed uh, and, then un and then basically unsqueezed and extended. When did that extension reach the Tetons? In other words, can you date the rise of what we consider the Teton range, which were part of the ancestral Grovance, and, and what's the evidence you have for that? Yeah, um, as I, you know, as I said in, on the one slide, it reaches here about four million years ago. There's good evidence that uh, Joe Lachardi and, and uh, Ken Pierce included in their USGS paper of two years ago, I think it is, <clears throat> and uh, you know, there are a couple of lines of evidence. One is that near um, Signal Mountain, there is Tiwanak Formation, which is roughly nine to 11 million years of age, uh, dip at about uh, 20, 20, 22 degrees. Uh, if you look at the um, um, Kilgore Tuff, uh, there's two rotated tuff beds in Signal Mountain in the face of it. And the steepest dip on uh, the Kilgore Tuff is right at 20, 22 degrees, which tells you that that's um, roughly the time, the, and the age of that is right at 4 million years. That tells you that the um, um, that rotation, which is on the Teton Fault, begins about uh, four or so million years ago. Uh, beyond that, uh, that Kilgore Tuff is a result of an ancestral Yellowstone volcanic eruption, a major caldera forming eruption, four or so million years ago. That location of that caldera at that time was due west of today's Jackson Hole, so just west of, of Rexburg, out in the, what is today the Snake River Plain. And if you had, uh, you know, uh, a mountain range eight or 10,000 feet high, you really can't, um, you know, these uh, clouds of ash and, 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 and gas uh, flow basically along uh, the surface and they're not gonna flow over the top of a mountain range that's uh, 10, 12, 13,000 feet high. So it would be, it'd be great if I had, I don't have with me right now, can't show you those diagrams, but I can give anybody, you know, the reference to that Lachardi and, and uh, Ken Pierce paper and give them the page number and the diagram number to, to look at there. That's probably the best evidence. Okay, excellent. Uh, so you got a slide uh, from South Pass that uh, shows a very flat line formation. And uh, can you, do you know which formation that is? And can you tell us more about that? particular slide? Well, I mean, these are uh, Mesozoic age rocks that are dipping off of the flank of the Wind River Mountains are off to our left here in this. 
um, we're looking across the Wind River Basin, and I don't, um, well, I, I think, uh, you know, brilliantly enough, this is termed Table Mountain. It's flat. <laughs> um, there are lots of Table Mountains all over the place. Uh, but these sediments are dated at, uh, you know, they're, they're older than 10 million years in age. So in other words, they're representing the basin fill um, in that period after the Laramide uplift of the mountains and down warping of the basins. This is part of the fill of this whole basin out here. Um, and this surface would have extended then, you know, thousands of feet in the air today, all the way across, and perhaps uh, in some cases, right across the top of what is today the Owl Creek Mountains. Uh, so stepping back a little bit in time, the continent to continent collision, the microcontinents that collided about 2.6, 2.7 billion years ago. Could you talk a little bit more about that uh, specifically? You know, what kind of evidence do we have for something that occurred so long ago? Uh, great question. And there's some really great technical papers if somebody wants to dive into them uh, by Carol and Ron Frost and other authors. Um, but what you look at when you look at the northern part of the Tetons here at these rocks and you look at the southern part of the Tetons, they're slightly different ages. Uh, they're slightly different um, rock types. And you can look at the pressure history, the temperature and pressure history by looking at the minerals that we see today. And you can see um, that um, one overrode the other. Um, and you know, there's clear evidence of, a, um, of this type of uh, situation where you have uh, one piece of continental crust um, trying to override another. And it can't go too far. You really just can't shove continental crust down into the mantle. And that's part of the reason why you build something so high in the Himalayas today. You know, it's the highest mountain range on Earth, and it's almost the only place where you have continent-continent collision occurring today. So, you know, those are the, you know, that's a short answer to a very long, complex story. And I can, again, I can get people copies of the papers or references to the papers uh, they want to wade into the geochemistry that explains, um, that proves that this suture zone exists in the Teton Range. Uh, so we have a lot of questions, John. Uh, you, you start by saying that in the sedimentary rocks, Wyoming is located near the equator. Uh, when, can you trace its journey from the equator to basically 43 degrees north latitude? And, and when did that transition happen? Okay, we can see here that North America is lying on its side at the equator. So, you know, and, and you know, the, the Rodinia continent, things are going in every direction, you know, north, south, east, and west. It's basically sort of exploding, if you will, um, very slowly in geologic time um, as these oceans open up. Um, and some are moving faster than others, but North America basically here uh, moves, begins to move north uh, and to rotate uh, so that, uh, you know, this part, which we consider to be Canada today, ends up on the north side of it. Um, and so, you know, if you go back to the earliest uh, Paleozoic, um, this is where you're at still roughly. The story is actually a little more complex than this, but we're not gonna get into the details of, of the, the wandering of these bits of, the, of these, these plates. But very simplistically speaking, by the time you get to um, here, these types of rocks, early middle uh, Mesozoic, North America is upright pretty nearly. Um, it's moved north. Uh, it's, you know, you're probably, uh, Wyoming is probably, you know, 30, 40 degrees north latitude uh, for sure. Uh, it's moving west uh, for the, you know, for, it still is moving west. It has been, you know, for hundreds of millions of years now. So, you know, we, it's very hard to know longitudinally where um, rock was at. It's much easier for reasons that I'm not going to dive into to know where it was latitudinally, at what latitude. Um, so we know that North America was a long way east of where it is today. Um, and it's been moving west, overriding the Pacific plates ever since. I don't know if that answers enough or not. And, you know, you end up with other, you know, here's North America in the Cretaceous. It's upright. Um, a lot of it is very near sea level. You have this uh, shallow continental sea that extends all the way from the Gulf of Mexico to the, to the Arctic. I think that's a very complete answer. Uh, Probably Dave, too complete. No, no, not at all. Uh, Dave Love references ghost glaciations, which he uh, says form some of the features in Jackson Hole. Can you comment on that? And that's what uh, he's talking about. Well, just to the extent that let's um, look at uh, maybe, 
I'll just, I'll just call up a slide here. <clears throat> One thing about glaciers is that if you've had a glacier and you left deposits of it behind, um, maybe let's look at this one. Um, glaciers uh, grind pretty thoroughly. And so evidence of older glaciers tends to be destroyed by more recent glacial, glacial events. The reason that this um, 130,000 year ago glacial event called the Bull Lake is still very readily mapped and seen is because the next glacial event, the Pinedale, 14, 15,000 years ago, didn't get far enough south to destroy a lot of the evidence. There are bits and pieces, so ghost glacial events, there's some evidence um, up in Signal Mountain um, of, um, you know, and other places, bits of glacial debris that have been dated earlier and older. Uh, and there's better evidence actually up in Yellowstone. If you want to read the Lachardi, um, Joe Lachardi, uh, Ken Pierce paper, uh, it talks about some of the various, um, the multiplicity of glacial events that have occurred over the last two and a half million years. So, you know, we see ready evidence of the most recent ones. It's rare to be able to see evidence of the older ones because the more recent ones tend to destroy the evidence of the older ones. Is that good enough? I think that's great. <laughs> uh, could you speak to the Red Desert? And uh, where does it development fall in the timeline that you've been discussing? Okay, well, the Red Desert um, is, is really part of the Green River Basin. Um, so it is a, one of the major basins. The basins tend to be wider than the mountain ranges. And you, know, you can see that here. You know, so you're starting to go into another basin here. You're starting to go into another basin over here. You know, these basins are many tens of miles across. Uh, the Red Desert is just part of the southern part of the Green River Basin, so it's uh, you know it's to the west, it's well, south of the end of the uh, Wind River Range. Um, it's it's a basically it's a it's a basin that wraps around the south end of the Wind River Range, and and uh, um, you actually get into the uh, uh, the Granite Mountains, uh, which is another major uplift in east-west uh, Laramide um, uplift like this. It's south of that. Um, I don't have anything to to show that kind of uh, picture here, but let, let me just leave it that it is a, uh, it's part of one of these big broad basins it, that is in between the mountain uplifts formed by the Laramide event of say, you know, 50, 60, 70 million years ago, which youngs across the state of Wyoming. It tends to progress in a rough way from west to east across the state of Wyoming to the Black Hills, which is the youngest feature. I, I think that's a good answer. Uh, can you speak- The only one I've got. Okay, well, that, perfect. Uh, can you speak to, the question is about the valley floor sinking. I think of it more as the valley floor rotating. Uh, is that still ongoing? How will we know when it does that? I'm not quite following the question. I, I can say that these valley floors go down um, partly as a result of flexure here. No, so, I'm sorry, John. I, I, what I'm talking about is in Jackson Hole today, ah. uh, how do the mountains go up? How does the valley go down? Is that still ongoing? Um, it is still ongoing. Um, and, you know, part of the evidence for that is the, um, the Teton Fault, the scar of it is, is recent. You know, human history in Jackson Hole is only, what, 120, 30 years written history. Um, um, Darren Larson is going to give a talk here later this spring about uh, the work that he's been doing in the glacial lakes here at the foot of the Tetons. And he is developing, and other people are too, real interesting evidence of when uh, the Teton Fault moved most recently um, and how, how often it has moved. Um, and that's a story that I probably don't want to get into. I'd encourage everybody to come and, and listen to Darren uh, talk. His talk is like in March, I think, March or early April, something like that. <clears throat> and um, you know, it's not a continuous uh, event, you know, every thousand years. Uh, it's, it's not like that. It's more uh, frequent at certain times in the past and less frequent probably recently, um, probably in part because uh, the ice has disappeared. Um, when the ice first disappeared 15,000 years ago, you're unloading and there's rebound and that uh, of, the, of the surface of the, of the earth, literally, and that causes more uh, seismicity. Uh, you know, that ice is long gone, and so that event has slowed down. There's also a swelling and um, uh, subsidence that occurs from Yellowstone itself. And uh, there's good evidence. We have um, 
uh, data that show that um, the Teton Fault is actually under compression today, as opposed to it should be under extension. And that's probably a result of swelling of the, T of the Yellowstone um, volcano, the, that great big uplift that is Yellowstone. And that may also, it almost certainly is contributing to a uh, lack of seismicity along the Teton Fault here today. That's a lot more than probably anybody needed to hear. And that's a whole hour long talk all by itself. I don't know if that helps or not. It does help. And it is a talk by itself. It is. The uh, Jackson Hole Valley is filled with lots of round cobbles of quartzite. And can you talk about where they came from uh, and why do they have this rounded appearance that, that, we, that we see? And uh, the postscript from here was that, yes, the Rockefellers were willing buyers from willing sellers. <laughs> it's true. Um, that's a whole nother hour long talk. Um, but the, about, short, the short version. Well, the short version is that um, there are some very, there's some quartzites. Uh, they're very resistant to erosion. Um, they, uh, the flathead sandstone is, is one. Um, there was another um, uplift out in what is today the Snake River Plain that uh, Dave Love shows good evidence of was destroyed by ancestral Yellowstones. Those um, more resistant types of, they're sedimentary rocks, but they're sandstones that are tightly, tightly cemented with, with silica, and so are much more resistant to erosion. Um, and so, you know, they bounce along um, underneath a glacier. You know, today they bounce along in the, in the Snake River and they get rounded, uh, but they're very, very resistant to disappearing completely. And, um, you know, if you pick them up, you'll see that there are chatter marks. There are scars on the surface of, of these uh, rounded cobbles um, and those are from these uh, uh, rocks banging against each other, banging against the, you know, the, the floor of uh, what's underneath the glaciers as the glaciers uh, push, drag them along. Um, and, you know, there's some really good stories. If you look at the zircons, the age of the material that make up some of these, uh, these cobbles, there's actually some cobbles uh, up in the in the Taugaty Pass area that show evidence that they came all the way uh, from uh, eastern parts of the US, um, you know, um, many hundreds of millions of years ago. There's some really complex uh, stories uh, about North America in its whole, in its entirety, that uh, don't have anything to do with the topography, the drainage that we see today in North America. That's just a sort of a taste that there's a, some really complex stories um, that have to do with some of the rocks that we can find in Jackson Hole. Uh, yeah, and, and, and sort of a direct follow-up to that question. Uh, can you comment on the challenges of septic systems uh, <laughs> in Jackson Hole because well, of uh, this fill that you're trying to, you know, trying to build a septic system in? Well, yeah, a, a couple of things I'll just say. One is in Jackson Hole, we've only got really one aquifer. Um, you know, it's not like there are multiple perched aquifers. You can't uh, drill thousands of feet deeper and find uh, another aquifer. You know, maybe if I could, um, it'd be very expensive. And yeah, I guess, you know, the water flows through this stuff pretty readily. And um, yeah, all I can say is, I guess I'm glad that Jackson, the town of Jackson's <clears throat> water system comes uphill from upstream from almost all the septic systems in Jackson Hole. Um, there are other people downstream. Uh, you know, we don't really want to talk about what's going on down at Holbeck Junction, but uh, you know, the wells and the septic systems aren't very far apart. And I would never personally design a system like that. And I'll let it go at that. I, I think that's a fair answer. Uh, so the red rocks that you describe, which are especially noticeable in the Grovant, uh, the Chug Water things like those formations, why are they red? And uh, why do they occur during the Triassic, Jurassic time versus the uh, older rocks that we see in the Tetons, the, the Madison and some of those other Paleozoic rocks? Okay, well, these rocks, um, the red rocks that you see are primarily um, <clears throat> terrestrial sediments. In other words, they're not sediments uh, that were deposited in a marine environment. Um, there, um, if you have a marine environment, you can, you frequently are going, that's where you're going to get limestones and dolomites. 
and um, they're almost never red. Even the red wall limestone down in the Grand Canyon, um, if you break a piece of it, it's gray inside, it's just uh, staining on the outside of it. <clears throat> these rocks, these sandstones, have had a lot of water move through them carrying iron, um, iron oxides, and that iron oxide gets deposited on these sand grains, and that's what gives you, it's rust, if you will, that's what gives you the red staining of these sandstones. If you actually break a piece of this open and look with a hand lens at the individual sand grains, they're clear quartz grains uh, and they're not red at all. So it's a staining uh, from the fluids that have moved through these sandstones uh, and left this iron oxide behind. And it's characteristic of these uh, early to mid Mesozoic rocks all the way across to Wyoming and beyond, up in Montana, down in Colorado and elsewhere. This is, uh, this is sort of a complicated question. Uh, Some of the others haven't been? No, no. Well, uh, opalites, which are, you know, quite present in, in California, are they present in the Tetons? And if not, well, why not? So you're going to have to talk about, I guess, why they are present other places. Okay. Uh, opalites um, are basically pieces of oceanic crust that have ended up on the continents. Um, it doesn't happen very often through geologic time. It does happen. Actually, you can see some down at South Pass. Um, that's probably the nearest place that you can see any. Um, if we go back here, um, there could have been oceanic crust in between these pieces. There probably was oceanic crust between these pieces of continental crust that banged into each other. Oh, in fact, there's, you know, if you look at this diagram right here, this is ancient oceanic crust that's disappearing down into the mantle. And that's usually what happens. Sometimes some of it does get caught up and preserved in these mountain ranges. Um, but when we look at um, the, uh, you know, if we look at the Tetons today, we're looking so deep into these ancient um, rocks, these ancient mountain ranges, the core of them, that all those sedimentary rocks and anything that would have been um, um, shoved up on top of them is long since eroded. I mean, we're talking about events that are occurring 2.6 billion years ago. So if we go back and look at this situation here, we're looking really deep down in, in the lithosphere. Um, you know, we're looking at rocks that were kilometers down in the crust. And so if there was ophiolite, um, Ophiolites here when this continent-continent uh, 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 collision, this Himalayan-style uh, collision occurred, they've long since been eroded and they're gone. But if you want to see some, uh, we could take you down to South Pass and we could, you know, we can show you some some bits of oceanic crust um, that are 1.82 billion years of age, something like that. Younger, lot, yeah, a lot younger than what this was. The uh... I'll make this the last question. <laughs> okay. Uh, the pulling apart of Western North America that is occurring now, will this, uh, will this cause an ocean basin to form in Western North America? Is this similar to what happened in Rodinia times when the continent was pulled, when the whole supercontinent was pulled apart? You know, is it, okay. is it analogous to what we see in East Africa? Um, well, it's not perfectly analogous. Um, but um, it is a major extensional event. And if you look right, let me see if I can, uh, I can't get the real nice um, highlighter, but the Gulf of Mexico, uh, Gulf of California is right down here, uh, you know, at the bottom of this diagram. And um, it is an opening, oceanic opening. Um, Baja California was uh, tucked up, right? It was part of Mexico and that Gulf is opening today. There is seafloor being created on the on the floor of the Gulf of California, and that probably, if things keep going the way they are, it, it will you know stick around a million years or two. Um, it may well extend up here into the southwesternmost part of the U.S. You know, remember that Death Valley is what four or five hundred feet below sea level. Um, the Salton Sea um, is you know, is a real low area here as well. When the Colorado escaped and got in there, it filled it up and that's why the Salton Sea exists. Um, there is some very low country down in this part of the of southwestern North America. And of course, Death Valley is the lowest part of that. Um, and there is a poss certainly a possibility that if you stick around long enough, the Gulf of California will wind its way all the way up to what is today Death Valley. So you could have, you want to buy some uh, 
uh, oceanfront property uh, real early, maybe now would be a time to go ahead and, and invest, but you gotta have a pretty long time horizon. Not from a geologic perspective, but from uh, yours or my perspective. So are mere, mere humans. Right. Uh, so John, I wanna thank you on behalf of all of us. We've had so many comments that this was a fascinating, interesting, thought-provoking talk, an absolute great start to 2022, where we have an incredible lineup of talks coming up. Uh, two weeks, January 18th, Mike Merligliano yep. will be speaking about the glaciers that still exist in the Tetons, and uh, there aren't many of them. And this will be uh, this will be a wonderful talk. Mike really does his research, and uh, I guarantee you will learn quite a bit. Our first talk in February, February 1, Mike Adler will be talking about climate change. And uh, Mike is someone who actually reads the uh, IPCC reports <laughs> and understands them. Uh, he, he does his own research, one could say. And then after that, we'll be going to Oman to look at Ophiolites, yep. uh, maybe the best place on the whole planet to see these very unique things. So an incredible year of things to come. John, I wanna thank you for, for leading off with uh, an excellent introduction to all of Northwest Wyoming. And All right, many thanks to everybody. And please do uh, appreciate what you see around here even more than maybe you did yesterday or earlier today, after you shovel all that snow. <laughs> Thank you, John. Good night, everyone. Thanks, bye everybody.